Welcome back, Nabil Qureshi. Did you all enjoy his, his talk? Was that? We wanted to take some time uh, again to um, unearth some of the ideas that he's presented, as well as explore some uh, questions or thoughts that you may have had. And you'll see the, uh, the phone number again. You can text any questions that you have to that number. If you don't have a cell phone with you, you can borrow the person's next to you or plead with them to, to borrow their phone. So uh, we do have a couple coming in. Daniel, would you have one? Yeah, well, and before we begin, we only have about eight questions. So Harvest, we're not impressed. We want more questions from you. We know you can do better than this. So there's a little challenge. Send us some more questions. We want more questions. But our first question is uh, to Nabil, uh, what, what is a, a good starting point in, in sharing the gospel with, with people of the Muslim faith? So a, a good thing to do is uh, just talk with people. <laughs> uh, That's they just, simple. They're, they're human. Um, they want people to talk with them. They want friendships and relationships just like everyone else. Like I said, about 90% of Muslims are unengaged by any American, uh, let alone a Christian. My mom's been here in the United States for 35 years. Never once has she been invited into a Christian home. Um, I have, uh, we remember one woman, her name was Robin. <laughs> Back in the 80s, she invited us to her home. That was it. Um, and my mom always appreciated her after that and she wanted to go see her again, but she couldn't find her, what have you. But, yeah, uh, relationships. Um, some people come to the United States. I remember um, hearing a story of a student who came to the United States from Saudi Arabia. He brought two suitcases full of gifts to give to people who invited him to their homes so that he could give those gifts to them you know, as a thanks for, for being invited. And he went back to Saudi Arabia a year later not having given a single gift away. Um, it's unbelievable. The, the Muslim culture is built hugely on hospitality. Um, you, you, you get to know some Muslims and you will see that hospitality is a major, major thing to them, as it should be to everyone, um, and uh, we, we are missing out on that here. I don't know why. Is it fear, do we think? Um, we shouldn't be afraid of anything. Second Timothy chapter 1 tells us that we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power. Um, but let alone of sharing the gospel. I mean, at most they're going to say they don't like us. What, are we so worried about our, you know, feelings that we're willing to withhold salvation from someone. When I was a Muslim, I remember when Christians wouldn't share the gospel with me, I thought one of two things was true. I thought, number one, either they didn't believe it themselves, or number two, they were totally okay with me going to hell. Wow. So just start talking and just start sharing your life. And in the context of that, opportunities will come up with, for faith. And if you don't know the answer to every question, that's fine. Just wait and look it up and read. Read together. Work through these things together like David and I did. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, you know, the Quran itself and sometimes the popular media and, and there's a Western assumption that all holy books are more or less interchangeable. Um, but the Quran does not read like, say, the New Testament Gospels. It's not a narrative. It's, it's much more difficult, actually. And there's an idea that even that there are certain verses that were written in Mecca, there are certain verses that were written in Medina, and the fact that those two sometimes rub against each other, they come into conflict. Can you give us a little bit more idea about the, how, how you approach the Quran? Yeah, the Quran is very different from the Bible. I mean, so the Bible is a compendium of 67 books, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament, um, and 66 books. And so what you have is a book, each book was written by an author at one time. It was written and done, written and done. The Quran is not like that. The Quran over 32 years, um, I'm sorry, 23 years was being revealed slowly. Uh, and Muhammad would give a little bit of revelation as was important to a certain context. And then he'd give a little bit more and he'd give a little bit more. And all these different revelations were put into a book later. They were all collected into chapters later. So you can't necessarily read from one section to the next and expect it to all flow. There's a lot of jumping around. There's a lot of verses being tossed in the middle. There's actually many stories in the Quran, and only one of them actually has a beginning, a middle, and an ending. All the rest of them pick up in the middle, or they leave off before it's ended. Um, so the Quran is very different. Uh, plus there are sections that cancel out older sections. 
It's called the law of abrogation. Um, some, some verses have actually been removed from the Quran altogether. They've been abrogated. Um, you actually had a lot of arguments about what should be the Quran and what shouldn't be the Quran early on in Islamic history. So when all these arguments started happening, uh, the successor of Muhammad, Uthman, said, we are going to make one final authorized version of the Quran. He took one, he burned all the rest, and he put one together and said, this is the Quran, so that people would stop arguing about it. Um, it's very, very different from the Bible. The history of it is different. The nature of it's different. We have to understand it for what it is. Yeah, I, I frequently say that reading the Quran is more like reading the book of Proverbs. That would be a, a better analogy. It, it, it is its teachings and sayings, but it doesn't, it's not a narrative. Right, and Muslims don't turn to the Quran like Christians do the Bible. I mean, Christians will go to the Bible for their guidance. Muslims will go to the imams for guidance, expecting the imams to explain the Quran to them. Uh, but they're not going to go directly to the Quran for any exegesis. They're going to go to their teachers first, generally speaking. What are, um, you hear a lot of people saying there's similarities between Allah and, and God. Are they the same? Uh, how would you answer that question? Well, the first thing I would say is that the term Allah predates Islam. And so the Christians and the Jews in Arabia at the time of Muhammad and before Muhammad used the word Allah to talk about Yahweh. So the word Allah is not something specific to Islam. And even today, Christians and Jews in the Middle East will say Allah to talk about God. So it's not specific to Islam. Um, now the idea of God, some people will ask me, is, there, you know, is the God of Islam and the God of Christianity the same? Um, do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? Uh, that is a charged question. It's one of those bumper sticker phrases that, you know, every time you see one of those, you have to stop and unpack it for a moment. What are you saying when you ask the question, do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? If you are saying that there is one creator of the universe who can hear, who has created Jews, Christians, Muslims, and he can hear all of them when they, when they pray to him, yes, I agree with that. There is one God. But if you're saying that the characteristics of Allah, as Muslims understand him, are the same as the characteristics of Yahweh, as the Christians understand him, then no, not at all. Yahweh is three in one. Yahweh loves his children. We are his children. In the Quran, Allah says, I am not the father of any of you. In the Quran, Allah's love is conditional. It says he does not love the people who sin. He does not love his enemies. Chapter 60, verse one. Allah does not love his enemies. You shouldn't love them either. That's what it says. Now, the God of the Bible is something entirely different. God loves everyone. His sins is rain on the just and the unjust. Jesus died for us while, he still, while we were still sinners against him. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. If he's hungry, give him some food. Totally different message. Totally different image of God. So it's important to know what they mean by that and then to make the distinction that Allah and Yahweh are not the same, that there are clear dif distinctions between the two. Yeah. There's also uh, the, the concept of Islam is, is really an all-encompassing idea. I mean, you have, you have legal ideas, like you have fatwas, you have, uh, and, and even the, the structure of the um, clergy, the imams, is, is different. Uh, why don't you go, because Islam is truly a whole way of life. It's not, it's not, we in the West tend to separate, right, separation of church and state. And that, that even that concept doesn't really resonate. Yeah, it's kind of like I was talking about in my, in my story. Islam is our identity. It wasn't just what we believed. It was our identity. And so as a Muslim, your, your whole life is structured around Islam. Um, like I said, the prayers that we prayed in the morning, that all came from Sharia, you know, how to, how to live your life. The word Sharia means path to water. And the idea is this is the road you should walk to get to life itself, to get to God. Um, now, Muslims disagree on the specifics of Sharia. Um, the Muslim scholars do anyway. You have different schools of Islamic thought. You have different sects of Islam, Shia versus Sunni. And they all have different approaches to Sharia. So there's no one book of Sharia. There's no one codified conclusion on this is what it is. The leaders are the ones who make decisions about how you should live your life. For example, the decision of when a woman can divorce her husband or not. Uh, a woman would go to a leader, a mufti, and ask, am I allowed to divorce my husband? He's doing this, 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 and this. And the mufti will give a fatwa. He'll give a decision, which tells her what she can do. Um, as a man, you can just divorce your wife. You can say, talak, 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 and you're done. You've divorced your wife. You just had to say it three times. Um, but, oh, oh. Yeah, right? So if someone's angry, it's, it's like, woo. Um, <laughs> 
But uh, for a woman, she has to get a decision. Now, if she doesn't like the decision, she can go to another mufti and ask him because the decisions are non-binding. So uh, some Muslim scholars are really opposed to this. They call it fatwa shopping. Um, <laughs> and, and they're really opposed to it, but it happens. Um, so this is what, this is what uh, the Islamic culture is like. Every single thing they do, how they live, how many times they pray, what prayers they're supposed to recite, how to fast during Ramadan, how, what words to say during Salat, every single thing is dictated to them. And they see this as a benefit of Islam. They will say, Islam has given us discipline. It's shown us how to live. And the discipline of Islam is, by the way, what, what intrigued Malcolm X. It's what took him to Orthodox Islam was the discipline. Um, so there is a lot of discipline in order. Uh, but we have to be able to explain that the Christian faith gives us principles to live by. Uh, the Bible gives us specific principles. Yeah, there are some rules, um, but for the most part, it's principles. And the Holy Spirit is within us, leading us and guiding us. That's the thing that makes the Christian faith uh, special is that God himself lives within us and sanctifies us. Just, just as a quick follow-up to that, because, because Islam is, there, there's so much works involved in it. I mean, I remember reading a, a, a fatwa where they were talking about doing salat, and if you do salat, can you wear a leather belt if the leather belt wasn't halal? Or what about the leather patch on your Levi jeans? How do you know? You know, I mean, it becomes... I'm following a Twitter feed called Islam Q&A, and I think they're on fatwa 500,000 right now. <laughs> Just <laughs> constantly giving out these fatwas. Um, uh, so I think it's hilarious. You can watch them on, on Twitter. Um, but yeah, there's, there's fatwas about everything. Can I pray when there's a picture in the room? Can I pray if a cat has been in the room? Can I, you know, all this stuff. And you're like, what is this about? But that's how they see, you know, their, their duty to please God. And a lot of these people are doing this so they can please God. Works, yeah. You know, and, and you, read, you read some of, for example, yeah, you have a lot of works-based soteriology. I have to do more good than bad in order to get into heaven. But then you have some people who, who aren't like that, like the Sufis. If you've ever met a Sufi, they will say things like, God, I just want to be in your presence, so you will, by your grace and mercy, reveal yourself to me. I can never reach out to you and find you. You have to reach out to me. Um, they sound, oftentimes, they sound very Christian. Um, the Sufi order was kind of built off of Christian thought that, that predated them. And so you'll find a lot of bridges. Um, but the, the key is, and I can't emphasize this enough, when you meet Muslims, don't think you know what they think. You don't, and sometimes they don't. But you need to, you need to talk with them and ask them about their lives, what they believe. Another thing to keep in mind is this next generation of Muslims, especially those of you who are going to Dearborn, this next generation of Muslims, they look very different from Muslim immigrants. So the Muslim immigrants who come have been raised in the Middle East or whatever, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan India, Indonesia, what have you. Um, they saw the world differently from their kids. My sister, for example, raised in the exact same household as I am, uh, she said to me one day, Nabil, I, I do believe God made you a Christian. I'm like, what? <laughs> and she said, yeah, there's many paths that lead to God. Uh, God wants you to be a Christian. He wants me to be a Muslim. I'm like, you didn't get that from Islam. You got that from Oprah. <laughs> but that's what she believes and she thinks it's in the Quran even though it's not so th there's a new generation coming yeah. uh, I th your, your testimony is so encouraging Nabil and it's a good reminder for us to develop relationships and not just think that we can uh, lead a Muslim to Christ in one conversation mm -hmm. that it's, it yeah. takes investing in them um, it was four years for me and, That's a long time, And yeah. during that time, David kept asking his church to pray for me. Um, and after wow. about the third year, members of his church came up to him and said, David, what are you doing? This guy is not going to become a Christian. You should stop sharing your faith with him. The Bible says, don't cast your pearls before the swine. Uh, move on. There's other ministry you could be doing. Um, you can't... You, you, first off, our, our relationship was our relationship. It wouldn't end whether or not I accepted the gospel. It was a real relationship. And that's what you need to have. If you have a relationship some, with someone so that you can convert them, they're going to be able to see right through that. That's not a real relationship. That's you using them. Um, so we had a real relationship for one. And for two, he just knew it took a long time. Um, yeah. And had he given up when he had given up, uh, that would have been very difficult. Kind of explain to the audience um, a little bit more about how much a Muslim is forsaking by, by coming to Christ and, and what's at stake there and that's why it's not going to just be an overnight conversion most of the time. Well, for me, the, the three things that I elaborated in the, in the talk, you have to give up your family. Um, 
And that's extremely difficult. I mean, for so many of us, our parents came from Muslim countries with nothing and they gave everything up for us. And they see our Islamic identity as our love for them. You know, obedience. And my parents, when I was growing up, never really said, I love you. That was not, it was a bit too crass for our culture. Um, they would show their love and the, the love was assumed. Um, so they would show it by taking care of us and by, you know, being kind with us and endearing. And we would show our love back to them by being obedient. That's how we show it. So when, when I turn around and say, I'm not going to be Christian, uh, I'm not going to be Muslim anymore. They don't just see that as, oh, you're making a decision that, you know, you're an, you as an individual can make. They see that as you are betraying all of us and you don't love us anymore. My sister, okay, I shared the gospel with her. I shared the gospel message with her. I sat down and explained it to her because she didn't quite get it. And when I was done, she looked at me and she said, Nabil, that is the most beautiful story I've ever heard. And I was like, and? <laughs> Don't you think God would be that kind of God who would only write the most beautiful story? Um, and her response was, I see what you're saying, but I just can't believe it. And what is she saying? She is saying, Nabil, I have a husband. I have kids. I have raised them in the Islamic way. I have, I have obligated myself to Islam. My parents, they already felt the loss of you. What would happen if I became a Christian? And who would I turn to? There's no one in the city who's ever reached out to me. No Christian I know here. Where would I go? It's physically almost impossible for me to do this. And so there's a lot that you're asking from someone who, who is considering accepting Christ. And that plays out in subconscious ways. They're not going to say, oh, you're asking so much from me that I'm not going to do it. That's not how they're going to say it. They're going to say, oh, that doesn't make sense to me. Or I still can't see how the Trinity works. That's how it's going to come out. But especially if there's someone who lives in the Middle East, you might be asking them to lay down their life. Uh, I have a friend who re reached out to a Muslim student here um, when he was studying in the university. He accepted Christ, went back to Palestine. Family found out he was a believer, and they killed him. Um, and that's something that still happens. It's something to think about. Um, so there's a lot that you're asking from someone. You're telling them to not just accept God. You're telling them to give up everything you've ever believed. Um, and start a whole new way of life, and that's a lot. So a lot of prayer needs to be poured into that person and, and, and establishing that relationship with them as well. One of the things that I, we haven't kind of touched on is kind of the capricious nature of Allah and, and the idea of, of you know, attaining salvation in Islam, walking across the, the thread, the whole, the whole thing. Why don't you explain how, how Muslims kind of understand that promise of paradise yeah so in the hadith as we read them um, Abu Bakr who is the first Khalifa according to Sunnis he's the next successor after Muhammad he said I would fear the deception of Allah even if I had one foot in heaven in other words he's stepping into heaven Allah could yank him out and throw him into hell um, and this is something that Muslims generally grapple with now our new culture coming up, like my sister, she thinks, no, my salvation is assured. But that's not been traditional Islam. Um, people are always worried about whether or not they're saved. Um, and the idea that you can be secure in your salvation, uh, such that you don't have to worry, did I follow this fatwa, did I do this, or did I do that? Oh my gosh, no, you don't, th to, that you could be free from that and walk in freedom. That's huge. And we ought to thank God for that, by the way. The Jews had to follow 613 mitzvot until Christ's sacrifice on this day, 1983 years ago, ended that so that we could live in freedom. We ought to praise the Lord for that, especially today. Yeah. Amen. We'll probably only have one, time for one more. What are, what are some, we've talked about all the, a lot of the do's, things that we should do in engaging Muslims with, with the gospel. What are some things that we should absolutely avoid um, talking about or, or discussing or doing when we're engaging a Muslim? That's a great question. And uh, just so you know, I have a little booklet um, that we should be in, that should be in the bookstore there. Um, I pretty much keep it at cost. It's like five bucks for the booklet. So I hope it'll help you. It's got a whole few pages of do and, do's and don'ts. Um, so if I don't cover everything right now, uh, it'll be there. Um, definitely, once you invite people, well, first, don't be afraid. Okay, fear is ridiculous, especially as a Christian. 
Um, that's not what we're supposed to be, that's not supposed to be our reaction. Secondly, don't hesitate to invite people. And if they say no, don't hesitate to keep inviting people. Um, because in our culture, it's kind of polite to refuse any kind of invitation or help. It's just someone asks you over to their house, oh, no, I couldn't impose on you. No, 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 please come. I'm, I couldn't do that to you. No, no, no. No, 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 we insist. Oh, okay, fine. You know, that's, <laughs> that's how things work. Um, so, so keep insisting. That's endearing. So don't give up. Once they're at your home, don't serve them pork. Oh, please. Don't serve them alcohol. Take the dogs out. Oh, please. Um, don't point your feet at them, uh, which is kind of like a, it's like, kind of like giving them the middle finger. It's very difficult to do that while driving, though. Like, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, so uh, don't. Those are a few of the don'ts. Um, and there's pork in things you wouldn't expect. Like gelatin has some pork sometimes in it. Um, so be, uh, if you show them, we went out of our way to find halal food for you, or at least food that's not haram. They would really appreciate that. Um, and also, don't hesitate to talk about politics and religion, because that's what, all they talk about in the Middle East. It's politics and religion. Uh, for them, they think, why wouldn't you talk about the things that are close to your heart? And so if you're not talking about your faith, it must not be close to your heart. Nabil, we, we really appreciate you flying down here for this event. Uh, we know God has some exciting yes. things in store for you, some changes. You're moving to Atlanta with Ravi Zacharias Ministries. Um, yeah. And uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the uh, church body here at Harvest, we would love to pray over you now and ask for God's blessing as you and your wife uh, enter into this new ministry venture. Um, before you do that, yes. can we also pray for Carlos, who, um, who is uh, trying to be raised up uh, as a, an apologist for the sake of the Lord, oh, especially to, um, to the Hispanics and Latin American people. So um, I've got, praise the Lord, um, so, many, so much blessings by churches praying over me. I want to, I want, uh, to take this opportunity, especially to, to bless my friends as well. 100%, sure. Let's pray for you guys. Father, we thank you for calling uh, people like Nabil into this ministry. And we pray that he would, you would empower him by your spirit to continue to equip believers to have the confidence in who you are and what you've done to go out and take the greatest message to those who are in desperate need of it. Yes. We pray for him and his wife as they uh, move and relocate. We pray for blessings upon this ministry venture, that it would be beneficial to your kingdom, and uh, that he would just make new inroads to his ministry there. Father, we pray for Carlos as well as he has a desire to make a defense for your faith yes, and to reach people like himself, Father. We pray that you would open those doors, God, that he would walk through those doors, that you'd give him boldness and tenacity, that he would be a careful student of your word and that he would have a heart for people. Yes, Lord. That it would not just be an academic pursuit, but it would be a pursuit to see people reconciled with their Savior. We ask all these things in your son's holy and precious name. We all pray together today and said, amen. amen.